Do you buy vinyl? I'm John Tejada. I'm Reggie Watts. And uh, we have a project called Wahata. Watts, Tejada. The Jay Silent. This is a Sarah Vaughan. Out of all the, the, the famous, I guess, the most successful uh, jazz singers of the 50s and the 60s, Sarah Vaughan, I liked her voice. Her tonality is like super, super pure, really crisp and clean. But I'm telling you, you'd be much better off without me. It's just incredible. Everything is emotion, execution, tonality, texture, timing, all that stuff. I think she's one of the greatest singers of all time. I jump up at dawn, shake out the sun, laugh like a loon, everything is fun, it's crazy, but I'm in love. This was just recently repressed, uh, which is Future Sun and London Life Forms. And their first album, Accelerator, was sort of club-based, and then they kind of flipped the script. It's got a little bit of atmospheric found sound, hip-hop beats, vintage synthesizers. I don't really actually know this record very well, but uh, it's Cannonball Adderley. Cannonball Adderley was, yeah, amazing. I mean, it was like blazing fast, but also really sensitive player with a really nice tone. That was definitely his own. It wasn't Coltrane, which was the most prominent saxophone player. That's what I really loved about it. And that my dad was like more of a Cannibal Adderley fan than he was a Coltrane fan. It's definitely helped my ear for finding melodies, for sure. Reissue. The double vinyl of Main Source, Breaking Atoms. This is probably my favorite 90s hip hop album, Large Professor at his best. I get tired, bring the court to my lips and watch the Large Professor do backflip. And I'm happy to have it on vinyl again. Sounding proper with double vinyl. Yeah. Never had that before. You always get 30 minutes per side and you can't play it out, so this will sound a lot better on the turntable. Why I'm so dangerous, call for the homicide, cause I knock them dead even when I'm at my work. The only future that lies ahead of them is the lights from the hearse. Uh, I just like this guy, I don't know this record very well, but Neon Indian, I just, I really dig this dude. He, I've seen him, or I've heard him, spin live, but actually both times at Sundance, weirdly. But he just destroys it. Like the first time I heard it, uh, I felt like, oh, am I in Berlin right now? Like it was just a perfect Berlin set, but in like an Acura tent. The last time I heard him at another after party at Sundance, and I didn't even know it was him. And I was talking to somebody, and I just kept listening, drifting up to the music, going like, what is this music? Oh my God, that's, oh, that's great. And I knew it was a DJ, because I could hear the live, like, crossfade. <laughs> and I was like, who, what is this? What is this? And then finally, I went downstairs and stumbled upon him. He was under the stairs. They put him under the staircase, and he's just there. It's just like spinning. I was like, oh, of course it's him. Anyways, really cool guy, young dude, um, killing it. Neon it. I used to get in a lot of car chases in Montana um, and used to race a lot of other like jetters and things like that at, late at night. I'd just put this on and that would be my super aggressive driving music. Hearing Ministry for the first time really affected me because it was the first time I heard like aggressive electronic music. It was like rock, but it was electronic. And uh, a huge fan of Knights of Red, but that was a different approach. There, theirs was a lot more minimal, more machine-like, and Ministry was like heavier, grittier. Like they really fucked with guitar tones and running it through digital processing and synthesizers. So it was a little bit more my style, technology-based, heavy, dark rock and roll. The word techno has been used in in LA Electro since like 84. This is Techno City by Avion. These guys did a lot of these records on McCola. That's just yeah. a great cover. That's You've awesome. Got the yeah, the seahorse keytar player. Yeah. yeah. And then a starfish laying it down um, with rhymes. 
And that was the world-class wrecking crew. That was Dr. Dre and all that pre-NWA. So they, they already knew that they were world-class. Eh, which one, which one? This Surfer Rosa, Pixies, classic. Everybody knows it. As a kid, I mean, the cover was pretty hot. That's what got me, of course, at first. Then I heard it, and man, it really changed a lot for me. Gigantic was a huge one for me. It was just great. It was like really super smart Midwestern Bob Mouldy and Husker Du kind of vibe, but like evolved with amazing vocals and the vision, it was just so unified. There was no other band that sounded like the Pixies and no, no band sense really. A band to be included in, in, in the innovation of rock and roll. We've got Fortune, Can You Feel the Bass, which I know and play still. That's the old Can You Feel the Bass. Can you feel the bass? But I don't have the B-side String Free, which is kind of like a 80s Chicago piano jam. Again, another classic record. I just went for high school stuff mainly. But yeah, Bjork's voice is just it's so strange. It was such a strange elf, like a weird pixie elf singing carefully, but then also just like honking out notes like a like a blues singer kind of. And then of course there was the dude that was like, why are people always looking at me? I don't know. That's why I always call the sugar cubes the Icelandic B-52s. <laughs> There's just a dude saying stuff. Got me a car, it's, you know, so it's, <laughs> as a kid, like it put me in another mind space that I'd never been in before without even any drugs, it was just very transportive, but very alien. It was kind of hard to listen to at first, and then I just couldn't stop listening to it. I've got some plaid here, a digging remedy. For use of melody and, and contemporary electronic stuff, uh, they're just super inspiring ever since the Black Dog days. Uh, there's just nobody like them. I think this is probably my favorite Smiths album. It was more atmospheric and experimental than uh, other Smiths records. Last night I dreamt somebody loved me. That song, it takes so long to start. It just takes forever, forever, and then, then finally it just hits. And, and I just loved how it just drug you through this, like this media mud before it got, it got to the song. And Death of a Disco Dancer was great because it was very kind of a political commentary on the uncaring record industry and only caring about their bottom line at the cost of someone's life. It had a huge effect on me and at the time doing a lot of Robitussin, which is a dissociative, a really interesting drug to listen to this album on, you know, when you're in your car next to a grain silo. So if you find yourself next to a grain silo and it's really cold at night and you're on Robitussin, this is a great record. The lanes were silent. Another old friends record with a reissue with a couple of extra cuts. Uh, Jan Jelinek loop finding jazz records. This is a, I don't know, house minimal techno record just made up of, of samples. And a few people do that. He really kind of pioneered it with his Farben alias. And it sort of takes the, when Thomas Brinkman was putting pieces of tape on records and just letting them play and letting clicks make music. So that's where like clicks wow. and cuts kind of came from. Yeah. Yeah. I should have found a Brinkman record, but uh, this is this is the evolution. Seattle kids are lucky. They're growing up in a lovely green city. I moved to Seattle in 1990. One of the reasons I moved to Seattle is because I heard about this band, Soundgarden. My friend Melanie was a big lover of Soundgarden, particularly the song Big Dumb Sex. Yeah. 
I heard that song, I was like, what is happening right now? I mean, it was just audacious, so much profanity, but like rocking. This record had a huge effect on me. I, I became an instant Soundgarden fan, and it wasn't too shortly after Soundgarden that I discovered Led Zeppelin. kind of realized that Soundgarden was the evolution of Led Zeppelin. They were kind of like a dark entity-based band that were kind of uh, channeling a world, like um, kind of an esoteric, kind of magic-based paradigm or whatever. It wasn't really so much about Chris Cornell, it was about Soundgarden. And then actually going to the Soundgarden, it's like maybe over 10 windmills that have these like weather mains, but they have a tube on the front part and each tube has a slit cut in, into it and as the wind goes over it, it creates a tone like blowing over the top of an empty bottle. You'd hear this ghostly like And then I realized, oh, that's all the distortion sounds the Soundgarden creates before a lot of their songs. You just hear this and I was like, oh, the Soundgarden, man, that's amazing. This record, Bad Motor Finger, for me, this is when they got their new bass player, Ben Shepard. It just changed my life. I'd never heard anything like that before. The, the rhythm on that just constantly, just an onslaught. Matt Cameron playing that beat over and over again, over and over again, over and over again, over and over again. And the guitar is coming in, layering in over that rhythm. And then hearing his voice come in like a screaming banshee in a storm, just like, arms out red. It was just. just blew me the fuck away. Soundgarden, Nirvana, all that was the last great movement in rock and roll. Last time that rock and roll was like dangerous. When Kurt Cobain committed suicide, I remember being on Capitol Hill and like hanging out at my friend's place and saw a person pass by the window, another person pass by the window, then like a few more and a few more, and I was like, what's going on? I put my head out in my friend's apartment and all these people were streaming down Denny Way to go to the Seattle Center. So we like just joined them and went down and there was like this vigil held. And I just thought to myself, this is never gonna happen again. No matter how great a singer, we're not gonna see that kind of a response to someone of that generation who was affecting people in that way. I don't think again, just because of modern internet and all that stuff, I felt really privileged to be a part of that moment and to hear all these bands come up, like these Seattle bands, speak their mind about the influence of Nirvana. It's awesome, it's cool. So much for sharing your records and talking with us today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.